Today I have two topics for you, two lightning talks, so you will see me 10 minutes. The first one is about GraphQL. You're probably using already GraphQL, there's a great package from Rusty. And currently we are rethinking, rebuilding our infrastructure in the background and thinking how a stack will look like in the next year. And it will be a lot of uh, React.js and GraphQL. So what we did is, um, or when you start using GraphQL or looking for it and using JavaScript, you, um, some, at some point you're coming to GraphQL, from, uh, GraphQL tools from Apollo. Unfortunately, this isn't available for PHP. So what we did is actually to port it one to one to PHP, including the test suite. So you have a lot of stuff available, just like schema stitching, remote schemas, and all this, all this shit. So you can use it in PHP. Based on that, we started to create a new GraphQL package with some advanced features, which we, which we need. I have to watch a bit. Um, for example, in this case, you define one endpoint, one schema, but you are able to stitch several GraphQL files together to have one merged schema. This enables you to do something like um, add some logic with another package, but build it up in your one, one endpoint, in your one schema. For example, this is now some root stuff, a block, a block package with some block types and some comments could look like this. So you see schema files, the first one is a root thing, then a block post which enhances the schema and the comment on the right side that just extends the block type so you can put several files together. That's about schema stitching. The next one is Resolver. It's basically the same you probably know from Basti's package. Uh, it's inspired by its one, so you're probably um, familiar with how you configure the endpoints and the routing stuff and so on. So you can define several resolvers for several types or um, resolver path pattern. Um, some more advanced techniques is uh, schema directives. You can define uh, your custom directives. By default, in the GraphQL specs, there are two directives, but you can add your, your custom ones. We ship three directives with this package. The one is out, the other one is cached and coast. Out directive looks like this. So this is a schema with, which is using all of them. What you can do is this annotation, like in the middle of the mutation, add hours required, and you just pass in a role user has to have or need to authorize with this, with this role. So whenever someone is doing a mutation update product, he has to be an editor, for instance. If he's not, you will get an error. So this enables you to do some declarative, easy stuff to manage and adjust your, your schema. So another one is uh, line 13, cached. You can just say, hey, this query, whenever this query is queried with the arguments, it's cached in your Redis backend or whatever, and you can pa pass some text so your application can invalidate the cache for the app. So example, and the third one is coast. What we do in the, in the type product is say, hey, this product, whenever it's queried, it has a coast rate of five. The name has a complexity or a weight of three, and the price by default is always one, so in total it would be a cost of nine. And when you go to the get product, uh, to the product's cost multiplies limit, so whenever you query the products with a limit of three, for example, you would have a co total cost of 27. This enables you to do some validation, just like whenever you're doing a query, you cannot do qu query something with a um, cost bigger than X. So you can ensure that you don't have too much load on your server or users don't query too much data, whatever. So it's something you have to handle, just check out whatever you're doing. It's cool to do some cost rates on stuff which is expensive to fetch, obviously. Also, you can do some um, dev validation, like maximal devs, how, how dev you can query. And this is also possible for every endpoint. So there are different. Uh, things for that. So that's about uh, GraphQL. Just check it out. I'll have a slide on the end with the uh, GitHub URL again. This is another project. I just thought, okay, NeosCon, cool to be here and let's show something. We basically had one year ago um, a small package to debug your content cache. I'm not sure who, who really thinks he understands content cache. It's, it's cool, it's clever, but it's hard to debug actually because you don't see what you do or what you configure. You just think, okay, it should be good. So what I did on the last weekend, and I will uh, continue on that on the next working week, uh, create a new near debug package based on the work we did uh, a year before. And I'll show you this in a live demo. 
So uh, you just require the package. There are two configuration options you can do. It's just, oh, let's play. Uh, just enable it, and there's an SQL module for now you can define or a slow query after in milliseconds, so you can say whenever a query hits or takes longer than 10 milliseconds, we consider it as a slow query. For this demo, I put it to 0.5 milliseconds or something, so we see it actually. This is pretty rough right now, but it's working. You just load your page, uh, and you bring up in a JavaScript console this enable Neos debug tool. Two is to set a cookie, so on reloads, uh, the stuff is still there. You enter it, the debug console will pop up on the lower screen. What you now see is in the first place, uh, uh, render time it took us 707 milliseconds to render. This was an uncached uh, fetch from a pure demo site. You see we had uh, 190 SQL queries are going on, 160 considered about to, to be slow, but of course of my, of my um, configuration. Then you can press inspect. Inspect will add some overlays about your single cache parts. First, it's cool to see which parts has an, a known cache configuration at all. What you can do is now hover this, this loop and you see some information about this, uh, this cache configuration. It's basically the configuration you did in your Fusion files, but you see the evaluated values, and that's pretty cool because you never did it before. What you now can do is see when this cache was created. So when I hit a refresh, no, yeah. Not sure if I'm still the server. Our server should be running. Ah, yeah. Okay. Inspect again and see it's 23. Running again. Inspect, and it's still the same creation time. You, so you, you can really validate the cache is fetched from the cache at all, and you see the the entry identifier. The cool thing now is to go through different pages and check if your cache you think should be used in several places is really used in several places for instance. Also what really helps is to, to debug or to optimize your cache configuration. Often it's stuff like footer or, the me or menus that don't have in state, always looking the same. In general you have some uh, document note or a document collection with a context pass in it. So you will generate for every page your footer cache, but you don't need to. So overwrite it and you're, you're good with it. So it's really cool to debug it all. You can click them array to, to uh, focus on some other things. You can also, on the lower left, cache this cache button. It pops up a module where you all have a table list of all your caches. You can check some details to copy whatever. And you can show hide, well, the root is nothing, of course, uh, which prototype is rendered in, in this fusion path, for instance. So this is still very rough. I, I know I need to do some CSS work and whatever, so everyone feel free to contribute. Uh, I'll post a link later. Um, the same goes for SQL queries. You see an aggregation on which tables are queried at all and, and how often they are queried, and the slow queries will, will dump the, the full query. So you can just copy it in your SQL Pro, whatever, and, and debug it. Um, for uncached and dynamic elements, it's also cool because you now can just see, for instance, this is an uncached, so it's red, and on a, on a refresh, you also see the render time it took to render this uncached element. Also pretty cool if you have some user menus fetching data from, from other sources or whatever. Um, on the, on the, uh, down here you have hits 9, misses 0. The numbers are okay, but not 100%. I'm missing some numbers because it's of the way the core is doing the, the content cache stuff. I have a pending PR, probably one or two are more incoming to get 100% accurate numbers. So the numbers aren't wrong, but they are missing some numbers at some times. This is because of the way the, the content cache is created at all. Yeah, I think that's about it. I don't have much time at all, so um, feel free. So, so the GitHub's URL to the packages. The debug is still pretty, pretty rough. I put a 0 0.1 on it, so everyone feel free to contribute. I also have some plans how to do stuff or what, what we can do. Also, it's called Neos debug. I'm pretty sure there will be a flow debug probably at some time or some stuff to um, put in your custom data at all to, to display them. Um, yeah. If there are any questions, I'm here around, or contact me on uh, Slack or Twitter, whatever. Or if you like to work on stuff like this on a daily basis, we're still looking for people. Thank you.
let's talk about documentation. Um, that's me, I'm part of the core team, that's all you need to know. Um, I believe that documentation right now is the most important effort to broaden our community. Um, let's talk about the challenges we had one year ago. Um, first, all of them, okay. Um, we had old and outdated documentation. You probably all know, read the docs, um, where there's a lot of outdated documentation and missing documentation. We had valuable information scattered around the web on different developer blocks. Our documentation was versionized, which meant that if someone wrote new documentation, it appeared in the latest, uh, for the latest news version, but not for older versions. And the core team and the, the people who work a lot with news had a very different way of writing code um, than the community outside saw. So the best practices were very confusing. And we had amazing support on Slack. I mean, probably everybody of you got help from, for example, Christian or, or Dimitri. And that was always one-on-one. -on -one. So that doesn't scale and uh, that will make it hard for us to become bigger. So what did we do and how are we trying to tackle it? There are three areas. Uh, one is onboarding of new developers. The second is the documentation which you work on a daily basis as a developer. So you need some function, you need some concept, some solution, and you're looking into the documentation to find a specific solution. And the third problem uh, area which arises is migrating old and outdated content to a current form. Um, onboarding, um, you have already seen Maya yesterday presenting the best practices, which we decided in Salzburg last year, which are amazing. Also, we have now a few um, implementations of these best practices. So there's mine effort with this Neoskeleton to give you a base template to start new projects. Uh, Martin totally rewrote the Neos demo to follow best practices and also the documentation website follows all best practices if you want to look about, uh, at a real life example. We have on the uh, documentation website an uh, introduction course with which shows developers how to start Neos and how to build the first node types. And as you can see on the icon, there's still work to do. There could be more lessons and there could be more, of course. Also, we are explaining now in the documentation some, some core concepts of Neos, which were always missing, like how things work before actually being very specific about function or something like that. Um, then something which is probably very interesting for you, the developer documentation. This is what I mean here is the things you look at on a daily basis. We have now evergreen documentations on, on docs.neos.io. So if something changes in a version, we'll just highlight specifically, oh, for version uh, Neos 5, this is different or something like that. But the goal is to have one documentation version which is evergreen and we separate it from the API references, which will, of course, be versionized. Um, on the docs, we are also split in two different um, ways. So there's, there's the manuals, and they are trying to be very general, very precise, and explaining what is done and how it can be done. And then there are the cookbooks. The cookbooks is an effort for for all of you guys, for the bigger community, to show your opinionated way of doing something. So I have this problem and I'm solving it in that way and I think that's great because of this and this is how you can do it. They can be specific to just one Neos version, they can be specific just for EFX or just for Fluid, um, yeah. And the goal is that the documentation website becomes a hub where all the information is linked, so we want to link to other blogs and YouTube. Um, content migration, we have a tag system on the documentation website which helps us keep track of what still is a draft, what, is a, what needs to be rewritten, what needs some review, these kind of things. 
and we are updating, rewriting, and extending the documentation. So are we done? Not really. Um, I think documentation must be part of our process for feature development in the future. That's something I want to discuss in the sprint next week, how we can integrate that so that the documentation will be up to date in the future. And there's two big things. Still rewriting, updating, extending the documentation will be another few hundred hours of work. And also, I really want to broaden the community. So if you have things you would write on your blog post normally, don't write a blog post, please write it on the documentation website. You'll have a photo, you'll be mentioned as the person who wrote it. Um, help us make the website great. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Martin Fitzel, and I want to introduce you to a small tool we created at Zeitgeist uh, to create responses image, uh, responsive images for Neos and to make it easy. I'm a back-end developer, so front, is, front end is usually not the thing, a thing I do daily, but um, I have fun doing so. I'm also a Neos core team member and usually play around with Fusion a lot and also created with my colleague Wilhelm the Zeitgeist Monocle Style Guide. So responsive images are actually quite an easy topic, and I just want to show you what are the standards we are dealing with. First thing is the image tag, which previously only had a single source attribute, but since uh, nowadays we have a wide variety of devices with different um, display sizes, it, in the last, yeah, I think it's some years already, got the attribute sizes and source set which basically helps the browser to determine during the time when HTML is parsed, which image would be ideal for the current uh, device and pick from the source set which actually image source will be fetched. There's also picture, which is for more complex scenarios, but I will not dive into this now. There's another interesting attribute, which is called loading, which is pretty new, and it, this one allows to control when an image will be fetched, so not all images in a website are equally important and are needed for the first impression for the user, and this attribute will allow in the end to control whether images can be fetched later when the user starts scro scrolling to the end of the site. This is quite easy, but responsive images are also quite hard, and one of the hard problems is that it's easy, not easy to spot when you're doing it wrong. So it's already hard to spot when an image has not the ideal resolution because it's not retina, for instance. So I cannot spot it. I have glasses. My eyes are not retina anymore. Uh, but it's even impossible to detect when a browser is downscaling an image and you are displaying a 3,000 pixel JPEG on a mobile device. So that is impossible um, to spot. So hard to get, uh, easy to get wrong, hard to do right. And also there's a really wide variety of devices we have to support and some of them even switch directions. And the users expect us to display properly still. There are also other parts that make it hard to do right. It's quite easy to mess it up and hard to verify, which is always a really bad combination. It's also hard to test because most browsers stick to high-res images they have fetched and will not switch out the sources when you're making your viewport smaller. You have to create lots of URLs. So if you're creating like a dozen of images for ideal resolution on each device, you have to communicate with the front-end department which resolutions you have to create and pass them as separate attributes or a huge array. It's always communication with a different department. And also, the loading attribute is not a standard yet. It's a recommendation, or it's in the specification pro uh, process, and Chrome in the latest version has it, but no other browser yet, so we cannot use it, or we cannot rely on it yet. Um, what we did at Zeitgeist was a little tool called Kaleidoscope, uh, and the idea behind this is that we don't want to pass around image URLs, or dozens of them. We just want to pass things routes that can create image URLs. 
and then allow the front-end department to decide on the actual resolution that will be rendered and which resolutions are appropriate in the case, and we want to make mistakes visible. Um, we did this with a Fusion prototype called Sidegas Kaleidoscope Image. Uh, it supports almost the same API as the image tag. Um, it has a source set where you can just leave out the URL part, you have the sizes attribute, and you hand in an image source. Um, we have also a picture prototype, which is more complex. And to create such an asset source that will be decided on, uh, that, that will decide on the actual resolution later, you have a Fusion prototype as well, where you can pass the asset from the media library. But also there is an asset source for a dummy image. And this is the one we use in the style guide. And we pass around, or maybe we use them also in the back end when no image is uh, inserted already. And for these uh, prototypes, or for these dummy images, we integrated a local service, a controller, it's no, ex no external service. Uh, so you can also integrate it in your test suite quite easy. And we built in some small tricks that make it really easy to spot mistakes. The obvious one is that we added the actual resolution as text, um, but also we integrated a more way pattern in the upper left corner, which is creating crazy effects when the browser, when the browser is scaling this image. And uh, we added a border around so that you can easily spot when the image is cropped at the left, right, or top and bottom, which also happens very easy and is a clear sign that you're not uh, using all the image or using a widescreen image on a, and only display the middle part. On top of that, we have lazy bones, which implements lazy loading. And the idea of that is integrate an alternative for, lazy, uh, for the loading via JavaScript, but make it in a way that we can throw it away once the standard is there. It's pretty easy and it's in the documentation. Um, it's all open source on GitHub and uh, the top two URLs are the both packages we use, and uh, the other two URLs are two good articles about the topic of responsive images and lazy loading. But you can also just Google the topics and will find those articles most likely. So. so, hi there. I'm Bernard, I'm working at Sidegeist, and I don't like to put all that much logic into Fusion. So um, let's have a look at how we can do that. This is a rather simple presentational component in Monocle, which has a very nice name. It's a text with a headline and link. It contains no semantics and no logic at all, except some few if conditions, which we'll have a look at later. So. Um, when we talk about presentational components, it's always said that they have some kind of API, so some props that I can insert into them and that are then rendered. So if we look at this one, um, for the Monica style guide, we have some prop set of label, headline, and so on. Um, what I don't like about that is um, when we have a look at the NEOS core and how it's developed further on, at every turn, we use value objects, for example. Um, so we don't use arrays because those are they are type safe. You don't know what goes in there, and um, you can uh, do lots of mistakes with them. So, but at this point, we do have an array, or do we? Um, what you can actually do in this one is you um, define an actual PHP interface for this component, which is this one. And um, la voila, everything you want to know about this component is right here. You know exactly which methods are callable and what they will return. So the interesting question now is, how do we get this PHP object into our presentational component? Um, if we have a good look at the implementation. So it's basically just a value object. You put in all the stuff that you need, um, and it's basically all uh, strings and uh, other things that contain strings so that the presentational component doesn't have to do anything but render it. 
So um, now let's look at the integration. Um, we have a block here which uses that in the intersection. And what it does is, yeah, we'll go fetch a presentation object and we use the e-helper to create this presentation object from our current document node. So um, this is one example how this could work. So um, this is not the block, but a product, but we, um, we do get a product node in. And uh, there's a figure with text box overlay object going out. And uh, what we actually do is, yeah, all that stuff that you usually would do in Fusion is done in PHP. And um, you just uh, translate this uh, domain entity into your presentation object. The nice thing about this is, uh, not only is this uh, completely type safe, it's also very easily testable because this is just input-output. So what we can do is write a simple unit test. Um, the, the most uh, usual test cases you have for these components is uh, the first time an editor creates this node, it's empty. There are no properties set. And we must prevent exceptions to be thrown at this point. So we test an empty node. Um, enter it into this factory and test whether any exceptions are thrown. And then we have the other case where all the properties are set and uh, we expect the uh, presentation object to be completely filled. Yeah. Um, to achieve all this, there's a nice little package which is on GitHub. It's uh, the Atomic Fusion Presentation Objects package. It doesn't actually do all that much except uh, that it throws exceptions whenever you do anything wrong. So you cannot pass a wrong object into your factory, or you cannot um, pass a wrong presentation object that doesn't implement uh, the defined interface, and so on. So yeah, um, if at some point in your project you'd like to have this testable type, type safe uh, presentation stuff, then yeah, take a look at this. It might help you. Thanks.